song before prayer. Savior, grant me rest in peace. Let us pray. Dear God in heaven, we come here tonight to worship you in spirit and in truth. I beg forgiveness for my sin, whatever I may have sinned or done, not according to your will, that you would forgive me, that you might hear this prayer that I'm about to offer. Most of all, dear Lord, we thank you for Jesus Christ, his sacrifice, for the fact that we could be here tonight, brothers and sisters in Christ. We pray, Lord, that as we go into this lesson, we open our hearts, our minds, look to you for guidance, help us to use all these things for the benefit and for the glory of your name. We pray for our brothers and sisters who are sick, 
those who have had surgeries, we pray that your healing hand will be on all of them. We pray, Lord, a, a prayer of thanksgiving for those who have been made well. And we pray that you'll continue to watch over us. We pray, Lord, for this nation. We pray for those poor souls who are trying to come to this nation, who are coming here and suffering terrible, terrible agony and loss. We pray for guidance, Lord, that another tragedy like those 50 people that died won't happen again. We pray for guidance, Lord, for this nation. We need a leaders that comprehend the rule of law, most especially the, your rule of law, God, that would direct us to love you and love others. If the people in charge loved others, a lot of those people like that 50 wouldn't be dead and wouldn't die of those terrible deaths. We pray for this nation to overcome all this, Lord. We pray for Christ guided, Christ and the Holy Spirit to guide all of us in the church to help and aid any persons that we can. We pray, Lord, again for forgiveness of our sins. We thank you, Lord, for the bountiful way you provide for us. We pray that you would continue to do it in the future as you have in the past. Again, we ask for forgiveness of our sin as we forgive those who sin against us. We pray this prayer in your most holy name, Lord Jesus. Amen. I told a couple of people on the way in, this is the quickest return I've ever had here. But the, tonight's visit was actually planned before Sunday, a week ago's visit. And I was looking forward to tonight already, and so it was a double pleasure to be able to come and be with you a week ago Sunday. One of the great challenges of speaking at different congregations is, is knowing what is, would be helpful. And when you're talking to a congregation, I don't have the blessing of being here with you regularly so unless I talk with someone or whatever and get a sense of what's happening I may not know but tonight's topic is one that I think it's safe for us all to hear certainly I need to hear it frequently and maybe you do too and it's the way we speak and the words that we choose when we communicate with other people have you ever said anything to someone in talking with them and no sooner did you say it than you thought, I wish I hadn't said that. Has that ever happened to you? Yesterday. Yesterday. <laughs> Not so long ago. It happens to all of us, doesn't it? And it seems like we all can relate because we've all done it. You've maybe heard the analogy that trying to take words back once they are spoken is like trying to put toothpaste back in the tube. I started to bring a toothpaste tube, to, but I thought that might not go over well to squirt toothpaste. But imagine trying to put toothpaste back in a tube. That's how it is when trying to take words back. You can't do it. The words are spoken. I know someone who th said one time, words are like things. They stick on your clothes. And she was so adamant and felt so strongly about it. She said, they stick on the furniture and all of that. Now, I'm sure she didn't believe that literally. But she would stop, she would say to someone, stop it. If they started saying something in her house, you know, negative about someone else or whatever, she didn't want any part of that because she knew the power of words. Down here in the South, we have an old adage that says, you can say anything you want to about a person as long as you end it by saying, bless their heart. But that doesn't, it's not true. And it doesn't take back the words that have been said. You've heard the saying, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. The truth is, if only that were true, but it's not. 
Our words have enormous power. The strongest weapon in the world is not the nuclear bomb, it's the tongue. Our words have enormous power, so much so that they can change the entire course of a person's life. Children who grow up being continually praised, and I don't mean in a false way, but who continue hearing how valuable they are, are going to grow up into people who believe it. Compare that to those who are constantly being scolded. I believe that children grow up into who they are talked into being. As adults, do you remember a compliment that you heard one time, or maybe several, that meant so much to you, you'll never forget it? I do. I'll never hear a, a finer compliment than Miss Bessie Porterfield, who's now in heaven, gave to me at Tro in Troy years ago when I was living there in the Hardy's parking lot. Her car was broken down, and in the course of our visit, she said something to me, and I don't know that I've ever told anybody, but I'll never forget it, because I thought, I'll, wow, I'll never forget that. You probably have compliments that you've heard like that, too, that have meant the world to you. Can you also, though, think about times you've heard someone say something to you that has hurt you beyond measure? And you've never forgotten that either. You see, they're still there. All of those things that we've heard are seared in our memory. And so tonight I want to suggest to you, if nothing more than as a reminder, that our words we use when we communicate to other people are serious business. And that there is supposed to be a difference in the way you and I communicate to other people as Christians compared to the way people who are not Christians communicate with other people. There's supposed to be a difference in the way we talk. Turn with me to Ephesians chapter uh, 4. Ephesians chapter 4. The Bible says you can't tame the tongue. But that doesn't mean we can't try. Just as, as Christ says, be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. Well, we know that's not possible. But that, that is our goal. And the same is true with our words. Start with me in verse 17 of Ephesians 4. Writing to Christians, Paul says, This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that you should no longer walk, as the rest of the Gentiles walk in the futility of their mind. See, he's talking to Christians. He's saying, listen, there's to be a difference in the way you walk or you live. Continuing verse 18. Having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling have given themselves over to lewdness to work all uncleanness with greediness. Verse 20. But you have not so learned Christ, if indeed you have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus. There's to be a difference, he's saying, in the way you live compared to others. Verse 22, that you put off concerning your former conduct the way you were, the old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, but you're to be renewed in the spirit of your mind and that you put on the new man which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. Now verse 25, he says something about the way we speak. Listen. Therefore, putting away lying, let each one of you speak truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Somebody will say, yeah, I tell a white lie every now and then, but I just can't help it. Well, Paul says you can. He says all you got to do is put it off. If it were going to be some great, it doesn't take a trauma to do it. He says, put it, put it off. The scripture also uses the phrase, lay it aside, regarding the ways that we were before we became Christians. Now, verse 25 is pretty clear. Put away lying. We know that lying is not a good thing to do. The Bible has much to say about the use of the tongue. But I remember thinking along the way uh, years ago, if there was just one easy standard I could use by which I could know if something was appropriate for me to say or not, it would make it so easy. And I happened to read Ephesians chapter 4 and came upon a verse that we're coming to and I thought, there it is. One little simple verse that I want us to focus on tonight, it's certainly not the only thing the Bible says about the words we speak, but I believe it contains an important key. 
and we're coming up to it soon. Let's keep reading. Verse 26, be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath, nor give place to the devil. Let him who stole steal no longer. That's, what is that, an amber emergency alert. An officer has been shot. Mm. Let us pray. Father, we don't know the details of the alert that we've just received, but we know that you do. And we ask for your protection in this moment, wherever this has taken place, that you will be with this officer, be with those who will be caring for him or her, and we pray that his life may be spared and that all things be done according to your will. Please bless comfort to those who are finding out and hurting at this moment. We pray in your son's name. Amen. Verse 28. Let him who stole still no longer, but rather let him labor, working with his hands what is good, that he may have something to give to him who has need. And here we are. Look at verse 29. I'm going to show it to you on the PowerPoint here. Going the wrong way, Mark, sorry. Verse 29. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. Now, it's easy for us to read that, and we're going to stop right here and think, oh, that, that's, I've got it, let's go on. But did you notice all of the truths that are in this single verse? Let me suggest to you, first of all, what the Scripture says we cannot say. Look at it again. Do not let any what? Unwholesome talk come out of your mouths. Now, we always want to see the Bible as positive. But notice it says, if you want your speech to be pleasing, then don't do this. Don't let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths. Well, what is unwholesome talk? The New King James Version uses the word corrupt. In essence, it means that which is offensive or which is not helpful or even detrimental to someone's well-being. What are some examples of unwholesome talk? Cursing. Profanity using the Lord's name in vain. And, and not just the obvious ones, but the little subtle words that we sometimes use that are plays on God's name. I won't quote them, but, but we don't... Euphemisms. We don't need to be using them. Anything that is profane is defined as that which is against God. And when we use words like that, that is a symptom of our godlessness. Cursing certainly falls into the category of unwholesome talk, but so do suggestive things that we say that might have a little hidden meaning. It could be jokes that have a little racial undertone or a little sexual current to them. It can even be comments that we make that are suggestive in nature. Ridiculing someone, cutting them down, telling a joke that's at someone else's expense, and the person we might even say, I didn't mean it that way, but you did. We did. We're not to be that way. Gossiping would fall into the category of unwholesome talk. That's not helpful. And then, of course, as we read earlier, deceiving or lying or telling untruths, those are all examples of unwholesome talk. And furthermore, did you notice it says, do not let any, none, you mean I can't ever? No. That's exactly what he's saying. Well then, Lord, what can we say? But only it says what is helpful for building others up. You see, our speech either is going to build people up or it's going to tear them down. Is it possible not to do one or the other? I don't know. But we want to be sure that our speech is helpful for building others up. It's a choice that you and I make. Have you ever heard someone talking to someone else and they just tear them apart with their words, just shred them? I have. Have you also heard someone build them up? 
My mom for years sold Mary Kay, and I've heard her say through the years, she's remembered Mary Kay would always say, speak to everyone as if they had a sign on them that said, make me feel special. You see, but only what is helpful for building others up. What kind of words build others up? Compliments that we offer, as long as they're sincere and not fake. You see, there's good to be found in all people. Now, you do have to look harder in some than others. I've got a student right now that is challenging. But I found in my days when I get so tempted and short, you know, I'll just sit back and laugh and try to find something positive, you know, and I just acknowledge it. And that has helped me because there is good to be found in everyone. It's how we look at the glass. Is it half empty or is it half full? I'll never forget my uh, band director in college. Years ago, I ran into him and he was the kind of person that everyone who, who he was around, they were the most important person, the best person that's ever lived. And he would brag about everybody to everybody else. One day I ran into him at the hardware store in Troy and I said, Dr. Long, it's so good to see you. He said, it's always good to see you, Art. Well, that went straight to my heart and I thought, wow, it's always good to see me. And I've never forgotten that. That little word, always. He may have told everybody else that, but he sure made me feel special. He was using words that were helpful for building me up. Offer people a listening ear. Sometimes that's the best way we can help build others up. It's not always even talking. And of course, the best way to offer words that are helpful for building others up is to talk to them about Jesus. Teach them the most important thing of all. Don't let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths. But only what is helpful for building. Did you notice that? Don't let any of this only this. In other words, every time you and I open our mouth, it needs to be something that's helpful for building someone up. These are the people that you might hear it said about, I've never heard that person say anything bad about anybody. Because they're always, and of course I know nobody's perfect, but by and large these are people who are always using language that is helpful for building others up. That's what we're talking about. Now imagine with me, what a radical, radical concept this is. If we only, everything we say is helpful for building someone else up. If that became the filter, if you will, that we would let everything we say pass through to see if it meets that criteria before we say it. Colossians chapter 4 verse 6 says, Let your conversation be always full of grace. Seasoned with salt. If something is seasoned, it tastes better, doesn't it? That it may, that, so that you may know how to answer everyone. We're to be lights in this world, to be in this world, but not of it. Let me ask you this. Do you suppose if we did speak this way, and we only said things that were helpful for building others up, they would notice and they might wonder, what, what is that they have? What makes them that way? Sure it would. Because they would see there's something different about us. Now, how can we know if the things that we are trying to say that to be helpful to people up, how can we know if it's going to be helpful to them? I feel like this thing is jumping ahead of me at some point. But the next highlighted part says it. We can know it's helpful for building others up because it will be according to their needs. Now notice, it's going to be helpful because it meets their needs, not ours. Have you ever talked to somebody and it's all about them? See, it's about, see, that's not it. But what if it's always about you? They're all, how are you doing? How can I help? How's your week been? You see, it's helpful for building you up because it's according to, to your needs. So how can we know what other people's needs are? Years ago, there was a theorist named Abraham Maslow, and he came up with this hierarchy of human needs. And I want to just share it with you because I think it does a pretty good job, and we can find biblical evidence for these various categories. I was thinking about that today. He said human needs start at the very bottom of this 
with the physiological needs, and that's everybody has a need for air and water and food and shelter, um, clothing, sleep, reproduction. So this is, do you have enough food? When people come to us and they need food, have you got a place to stay? See, these are things we can use our words for to help meet a need. Then you start moving up after people have that basic need. He said, then they're concerned with safety. Do they have personal security? Are they employed? We help people. We try to help them find jobs, find work, put them in touch with people, find resources, make sure they have that, what they need to be safe, health care, even their property. Then you move up to love and belonging. Everyone has a need. Once those bottom two are met, they have a need for friendship. They have a need for intimacy, for family, a sense of connection. It's one beauty in the church. Come be with us. We'd love to have you. And then esteem needs respect. Help them learn to see other people and know other people. You could say, have you met so-and-so? I think you two would have a lot in common. That's a really neat person. I'd like you to know each other. Finding love and acceptance how many people feel that life is over for them, that they've made too many mistakes, and that's one way we can help them know it's not over. That's what Christ came for. It's what he died for, and we have a message for you. Just not long ago, someone told me they thought they had messed up so bad they could never go back to church. I know somebody whose family is going through a situation right now, and they don't want anybody at church to know it. How tragic. How tragic. Church is the place you should feel most comfortable to share it. We're to be a hospital for the wounded and not kick them when they're down, certainly. A haven for the hurting. Offer them help for their problems. I, I wanted to go on up to self-actualization. The desire to become the best that you can be. That's the message we proclaim every time we get together, isn't it? The very best life is the Christian life, the life to be found in surrendering our life to Christ. Friends, we need to be about only talking about things that will be helpful for building others up according to their needs. I'm awfully afraid that we talk about things that have little to no eternal value a lot of times. And we talk instead about things that are going to one day burn and be gone. We should be talking about things that are going to last forever. Only one life, it will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. What can we say or what can we not say? No unwholesome talk. Well, then what can we say? Only what is helpful for building others up? How do we know if it's building them up? It will be according to their needs. Well, what are their needs? Well, we have to get to know them to find out. And then finally, what if we change our speech in this way? And maybe you already do it, and God bless you if you do. But if we work to make this our goal, what will be the outcome of our interaction with other people? The last part of the verse tells us it will benefit those who listen. Now, who's it going to benefit? It's not going to benefit us. It's going to benefit the people that we are talking to. In other words, we will make a difference in the lives of people who communicate with us. I want to suggest to you that this is a three-point test we can use before we say anything, anytime, anywhere to anybody. Number one, will what I'm about to say be helpful for building others up? Number two, Will this help meet their needs? And number three, will this be beneficial to them? If it passes that three-point test, then say it and know that you have God's blessing. If it does not, then refrain from saying it. And if you are not sure, when in doubt, speak not. It's just that simple. And it's just that difficult. We've got just a few minutes left here. This was, this was so transforming to me, and I, I hope it will be for you, to think about 
does our speech do this for other people? There's a, a neat little book. I, I didn't even plan to say this, but it's called Don't Sweat the Small Stuff. And one of the chapters in there says, when you talk to other people, pretend that everyone you're talking to, every, pretend everyone you're talking to has something to teach you. And that has been very helpful too. When I'm thinking, what in the world is this? Then you think, what am I learning from this? And that can bring patience too. Let me suggest to you finally some practical tips here. Number one, about our speech. We need to be slow to speak. Ephesians 5 verse 2. Ecclesiastes rather. I, I miswrote the scripture passage. Ecclesiastes 5 verse 2. It says, do not be quick with your mouth. Do not be hasty in your heart to utter anything before God. Now listen to this. God is in heaven and you are on earth so let your words be few. Do you realize as Christians that we are to be people of few words? It's ironic, isn't it? We have the message that everybody needs to hear. And yet, people who talk all the time, what do we know about them? Nobody listens. They tune it out. But people that don't talk that much, too much, when they speak, you listen. The Bible says we don't need to be too hasty about this. God is in heaven. You're on earth. Let your words be few. A statistic says that the average person, the average man, speaks 20,000 words each day. In one year, that's enough words to fill up 66 books that are 800 pages each. We're talking too much. Years ago, Julie Andrews' husband, I heard him interviewed on Larry King Live, and he made this comment, and it stuck too. He said, I never learn anything new when I'm the one doing the talking. Is that a good point? All we do when we talk is share what we know. We have to listen to learn. James 1 verse 19 says, everyone should be quick to listen, but slow to speak and slow to become angry. You've heard it said we have two ears and one mouth for a reason. And another suggestion regarding this be slow to speak, we need to help others and not encourage them when they start to catch themselves and refrain from saying something. It's easy to say, oh, go, go, go on and say it. You've started. But we need to be the ones to say, it's okay. If you don't need to share that, I understand. Don't tempt them and lead them to sin in their words. Be slow to speak. Number two, we need to be mindful of speaking simply. Jesus did. Jesus talked about the birds and the air and the flowers and the trees. Matthew 6, the lilies of the field, the grass of the field. You see, he met people where they were. He wasn't trying to impress them with his big words. And we should be the same way, not trying to talk over people's heads to impress them. I remember a famous preacher I heard one time being heard about. He was asked to pray. And you know what he did? It was before a meal and he's, he led this prayer. God is great. God is good. Let us thank him for it. He led that children's prayer. And that was enough. We can be simple in what we say. James 5 verse 12 supports that idea when it says, Above all, my brothers, do not swear not by heaven or by earth or by anything else. Let your yes be yes and your no, no, or you will be condemned. You see, we shouldn't have to qualify. And, and uh, I, Yes, and you can really believe me when I say this too. I'm, I'm telling you the truth. If we have to say that, we've messed up somewhere along the way, right? Because we should be able to say yes. And people know that we mean it because we speak simply. And finally here, we need to keep our heart clean when it comes to our words. That may seem like an unusual analogy, but you know, the Bible does say there's a connection. Matthew chapter 12, beginning in verse 34, Jesus says, Out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. The good man brings good things out of the good stored up in him. And the evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in him. So there is a connection between what you hear a person say and the condition of their heart. You want to know what kind of heart they have? Listen to their words. 
we need to make sure we guard our hearts because our hearts or our words reveal what's in our hearts. Our prayer should be like we read in Psalm 19, verse 14, may the words of my mouth and what? The meditation of my heart be acceptable, pleasing in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. This topic is one I, th I, need, I know I need to hear. I think we all do from time to time. And it's a serious matter because Matthew 12 also says that men will have to give account on the day of judgment for every careless word they have spoken. For by your words you will be acquitted, which means cleared or freed. And, and by your words you will be condemned or doomed. May God help us to learn to use the words of our mouth so that we don't ever say anything unwholesome. We only say those things that are helpful for building others up according to their needs so that they will be benefited by having talked with us. Let us pray. Father, we're so thankful for the Bible and the guidance that you give us through it. Please sink these truths as well as every truth we encounter through our study of your word deep into our hearts and enable us that we can put them into practice so that we can be truly the hands, the feet, the eyes, and even the, the mouth of your son in this world. In his name we pray. Amen. who not only loves the Bible, but also can tell you certain hymns that have been influential in his or her life. And the, the author who wrote that said that next to the Bible, the hymn book is often the greatest thing we have in our aid to living the Christian life. So tonight, as we prepare to offer an invitation, I want to share the lyrics of this song with you. They're so beautiful and so meaningful. Softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling. Calling for you and for me. You see on the portals, he's waiting and he's watching. Watching for you and for me. Why should you tarry when Jesus is pleading? Pleading for you and for me. Why should you linger and heed not his mercies, mercies for you and for me? Time is now fleeting. We may not realize it. But like that. Time is now fleeting. The moments are passing. Passing from you and from me. Shadows are gathering. Our deathbeds are coming. Coming for you and for me. Oh, for the wonderful love he has promised, promised for you and for me. Though we have sinned, he has mercy and pardon, pardon for you and for me. Come home, come home. You who are weary of living your life the way you've been living it, trying to make it work on your own and realizing it's never going to work. Because we all have a God-shaped vacuum within us that only he himself can fill. You who are weary, come home earnestly, tenderly. Jesus is calling, calling, O oh sinner, come home. Is that what you need to do? Maybe so. If you've never done that, you don't know what real life is. I would suggest you haven't even really started living. The only way to avoid getting to the end of your life and looking back with regret is having given your life to the Lord as soon as you're in your life as you possibly could. 
and we want to encourage you to do that if you have not. Most in here have. And then the question is, are you still dead to yourself? Are you still allowing Christ to live his life in you and through you so that it's not even you that people are really talking to? Because you have died. Paul said, Galatians 2.20, I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer me who lives in here, but it's Christ who lives within me. And that's what we're wondering about. And what we need to always strive to be is to allow ourselves to allow him to live through us, to die to ourselves, that is. It's called the exchanged life. Are you doing that? If not, then, then you need to make things right too. What will you be doing tomorrow if tomorrow is just like today? What kind of life will you be living if you continue living the same way? You are where you've been coming to. It always works out that way. And you'll be just where you're going unless you change today. Many have said, I'll make that change and then decided some other day. But other day for them never came before their lives were swept away. What if that city, that silent city, could speak to us some way? Why don't you know that millions would say, don't wait another day? For I waited, and I waited too long, they'd say. For me, it's now too late. What about you, my brother, my sister, my friend? Why on earth do you wait? There'll probably be a, never be a more convenient time than now in all of your life as long as you live, and yet you wait somehow. Make the wisest choice that leads to life. Don't wait. Don't be one who waited too late. Perry, would you be willing to sing softly and tenderly? Let's do that. And if we can be of any help to you tonight, whatever your need may be, would you please come while we sing? Softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling, calling for good and for free. Sing of the Lord while he's waiting and watching, watching for you and for me. Come home, come home, come home, you who are weary, come home.
Our holy and righteous heavenly Father, as we come to the close of another day in this life, Father, we're so thankful for the wonderful blessings that you have bestowed upon the young one of us. We're so thankful, Father, that we could come here tonight and hear another portion of your word. Father, I pray that we'll put that lesson in our hearts and our minds and try to be stronger in the future than we are in the past. Father, we're thankful for Brother Art. We pray that you give him a long, prosperous life in your service. Father, we're so thankful for this congregation here. We're so thankful for the blessings that they have bestowed over the years. We're thankful for Brother Mark. We pray that you will be with the leadership here. They will continue to do what they're supposed to do. Also, Father, we're thankful for our eldership, and I'm thankful for our leadership. We're thankful for our children. We pray that we will always try to set the proper example for them. We pray now, Father, that you would go with us throughout this day and throughout the further walks of life. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen.